my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker. Sherry Reggiani will be speaking on the topic, I work for a mercury-free dentist, now what? Sherry is a veteran, having served in the U.S. Navy Dental Corps. We thank her for her service. She proceeded from there to get her Associate of Arts, and then a Bachelor of General Studies from Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan and then her hygiene degree from the School of Dental Hygiene at Old Dominion. Sherry's been teaching courses on practice management, time management, human resources, as well as nutrition, dental hygiene, and general dentistry. Having heard her speak before, you're in for a real treat. There's a lot of punch in this little thing. <laughs> <laughs> Please give her a good welcome. Thank you. And before we get started, you've heard the disclaimer before. I do not have any interest, any financial interest in a product in my talk or with any companies offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. With that, you learned a lot of science the last two days. Well, today and tomorrow. Now we're going to talk about what you're going to do with it. By show of hands, how many dentists in the room? Okay, how many practice administrators, office manager, assistants, okay, assistants, and hygienist. No hygienist. Oh, I'm a former hygienist. That's okay. Let's talk about what's happened in dentistry. Your dentist either changed and became mercury-free, or you accepted a position in a mercury-free office. One way or another, you came up the stream like I did, an amalgam office, and suddenly life changed. But what really changed? There we go. A traditional dentist needs staff. A mercury-free dentist needs staff. Really? There's no difference. Or is there? The Academy says, show me the science. The classes today, the classes tomorrow, the classes in the years past and in years to come have taken dentistry to a whole nother level. It's no longer a hole in the tooth that needs a filling. Patients, however, have a different percep perception and perspective of that. <laughs> so, now we need to take the science from what you know to the average public. Science has done a lot. Film has gone to digital images. Medicine has gone from exploratory surgeries to MRIs. RK and PK surgeries to Lasix, self-exams to mammography, and mercury to beautiful, youthful, tooth-colored materials. But remember this, mercury leaks out of fillings, but no material is 100% biologically compatible. We need to bridge that gap in between the two. So science has changed dentistry, but there you are, caught in the middle. You're in a mercury-free practice. How do you feel about it? What the dentist doesn't know is that you are an ambassador to his practice, his or her practice. What the dentist doesn't understand is that you have brought, what the average dentist doesn't understand, is that you have brought your own feelings and your own thoughts into this office. Do you have amalgam in your mouth? Just show of hands. I won't take names. Okay. Why or why not? <laughs> Do you get your teeth cleaned every six months? Yes. Okay, that's a start. You also have to schedule in a way for your staff to get their dental needs taken care of as well. We'll talk about that. Okay, remember, legal disclaimers. If there's something you don't understand, ask your doctor. That's what your doctor is there for, just like the patients. Facts in the Academy, let's go over this really quickly. There's a lot of information to be had these next two, today and tomorrow, but most people still don't understand a silver filling is 50% mercury. I need to move over. Okay. Just, okay. All right. A lot of people have the perception that, gee, my old dentist said that that mercury isn't a problem because it's locked into the filling. Mercury is a poison. It leaks. That science is a done deal. It vaporizes easily at room temperature. The World Health Organization has concluded that dental fillings contribute more mercury to a person's body than any other source of mercury, all other sources combined. 
and the, public research, the published research is there. I won't walk out of the picture. No amount of exposure to mercury vapor can be considered harmless, especially considering its cumulative effects. That's fact. You have that in your handout, take it back to your practice. When a patient says, I don't know if there's a problem, can I just have what my insurance pays for? You're doing a health service. You don't have to be an alarmist, but you do have to present fact. So it solved the problems before they happen. You talk to your patients honestly. Removing mercury will not cure them of any disease. If you're a practice like mine, in a community I'm north of Metro Detroit, we have media that depending upon the flavor of the month will either think that there's been a mercury spill at a high school, it's the worst thing in the world, they've evacuated the building, they had less than a drop. And so people think of the issue. And then there will be some health advisor coming on saying there's mercury in fish, it's a toxic problem, can't have fish, and then a dentist will come on, but there's no problem with the fillings in your teeth. It's not going to cure anybody of any disease. True, it's not. You're not there to cure disease, but you're going to re reduce the toxin from the body. You're going to reduce the body's burden. And doctors, talk to your staff openly. Everybody has to communicate the same message, and if a team member misquotes the doctor, you, meaning the doctor, the hygienist, everyone's in jeopardy. So doctors always love this slide. Prepare before the doctor walks in the treatment room. If you've recently switched to mercury free, in my mind recently means within the last two years and your staff has been with you during that last two years. If you've been mercury free for 10 years but you now have a new staffer, you fall into that new category again until that person comes on board. Decide with your doctor how you're going to present something to the patient. Doctors, this is what staff means, are critical times to give this information. And all the staff should be on board and competent. Not just your assistant. Your assistant might know exactly what you're doing, how you're going to do it, but who answers the telephone? Oh, that's right, that's the business staff. They need to know every bit as much information as everyone else. The hygienists no longer polish amalgams. I could take the ugliest MOD with broken down margins and you give me a six round, I'm going to make it look like the day it was put in their mouth. Did it a lot too. And I breathed it in all the time. It's not just the patient with the problem, it's the staff who's working with those patients. And assistants learn the steps used in adhesive dentistry. It's recently working with an office, dental assistant in her 40s, dentist switched to mercury free and he could not figure out what the problem was. Staff's been with him a long time. Finally, talking one-on-one, -on -one, the one woman said, I'll hand him what he asked for. I'm not buying into this. It's a lot of hype. He doesn't know it yet. I've got my feelers out. I'm looking for another office. The writing's on the wall. Mercury is going away. The science is there, the issue is done. If you don't want to come along with that, then you should be finding yourself a different career. In that case, that person is no longer employed in that office. Now, <laughs> from the doctor's point, yeah. And why is this, doctors? Because you have to educate your staff. You come back, you're at a seminar, you're enthused, and those of you who are staff here and your doctor's not in the room, you know what happens. A weekend later, that doctor's brain is crammed through 16 hours worth of information, and you've got a five minute little mini meeting maybe before the first patient of the day. There's no way they can relate all that to you. So, we use role playing at staff means. We're gonna do that in a few minutes. Memorize scripts until you get the routine down, doctors, staff, if your staff write down the way you would like to answer questions for your patients. Doctors, write down what you think your staff should say. Compare notes. If the staff way sounds a little better, use that. If the doctor's way, if the doctor likes his way better, by all means use that, but decide what you're going to say and stick to that script. If everybody gives the same answer, patients understand, treatment is accomplished. 
And remember, you're all on the same team. This is not the front staff against the back staff. The assistants on board, I know exactly what we're doing. The hygienists say, well, okay, there's that whole mercury thing, but I just know that if I polish these amalgams, marginal ridges are going to you know, be recontoured, and I'm going to reduce the potential for new decay. I'm going to reduce those little food traps. Can't do that. You're all on the same team. So let's speak to everyone. There are studies done in the 20s. You've all heard about this. The right brainers, the left brainers. Patients and staff. The left brain says it's linear. They're thinking there is a hole in this tooth. Hole needs to be filled. Very rational. Therefore, I need a filling. I will make my dental appointment. These are the men, usually. Us right brainers. Very touchy-feely. Oh, I don't want to have pain. I want to manage this on my time, not on the day that my tooth bothers me. We're emotional, and we're usually women. And I hope you appreciate the font. <laughs> so you have to speak to everyone. Anybody know what NL NLP is? Neurolinguistic programming. Body language. If I walked in here and said, gee, you know, lately I've been speaking to younger audiences, I've been speaking to high schoolers, and I hope that you'll listen to what I have to say today because I think it's important. I'm minimizing myself and you would not believe me. But why do you do this to your patients? Um, okay, Mrs. Smith, that tooth over there, uh, okay, it's it's got really bad decay in it and doctor's going to have to do a root canal and then there's not any tooth left there so he's going to have to make this core of material and then we're going to have to put a crown on it and it's going to be like $2,500 <laughs> instead of Mrs. Smith <laughs> yeah you've ignored your teeth for a little while but that's okay we've seen worse than that we don't have to get rid of the tooth doctor will, will come in and you could already go over the x-ray with them, right? Doctor's going to come in. We can do a root canal on this tooth. You can see there's just a little shell left. There's nothing left of this tooth. But we've done, <laughs> we've done cases worse than yours. Dr. Smith is very accomplished. We're going to build up a core. We're going to make a fake inside of the tooth. And then we're going to put a crown on it. It's going to be beautiful. It's only about $2,500. You're going to go up to the desk and talk to Michelle. Or she's going to come in and talk with you. And explain how we handle the finances for that big difference. Never, never say, would you like to pay? Go to Target, go to any grocery store, you're checking out. If they ever say, do you want to pay? <laughs> Every now and then I call to put some of my bills on charge cards and I love it when they say, what would you like to pay today? <laughs> I'd like to pay 20 bucks, but I don't think that's going to cut it with your boss. <laughs> so, this is the charge. It's $2,500. You have a $1,000 annual deduct or an, uh, annual insurance benefit. You've used about 400 of that. It's going to pick up $600 of that, which is great. Okay, this is how we handle the rest of it. Matter of factly, when you go to the grocery store, they never ask if you'd like to pay. And the way you present it, oh, you know what? Back then. The way you present it makes all the difference in the world. When you're treatment planning, if you lean into your patient and you look as if you're interested in their health, they're going to be listening to you. If you mirror their body image, they're going to be interested in you. In fact, if you, there are studies that show if you mirror a person's body image, if they put their hand behind them, if they cross their legs and you do the same, suddenly they start to like you. They don't know why, but they like you and they trust you. So start doing that. If you have children, start doing that when they talk to you. And it's amazing, they start to listen to you. Let's go back here. Predictive dialogue. What that means is giving you choices I want you to choose from. Would you like to come in, I've got an opening this Thursday at 1, or I've got one next Wednesday at 9. You don't say, would you like to make an appointment? And we're going to validate the patient's concerns. Three things that every patient, no matter who they are on the face of the planet, thinks of. Who can yell out number one? What's the first thing they think of when they go to a dentist? Come on, anybody. Heard two of them. Pain number one, money number two. What's number three? How long is it going to take? So you answer them in reverse. We're going to be able to take care now. Something small. We're going to take care of it today. Or endo crown. It's going to take a couple visits to take care of this. It's going to cost a thousand dollars, and we're going to talk about how we're going to keep you comfortable while we're doing that. 
the last thing you want to leave in their brain is that we're going to keep you comfortable. Watch the nomenclature. It is not an endo on number 14 followed by a PGC. It's a root canal on that upper left molar, the one that's been bugging you, and there's not enough tooth left, so we're going to cover the whole tooth afterwards with a crown. It'll give it a lot of support, and it's going to look beautiful like that tooth never had a cavity a day in its life. Patients talk to the staff when they don't want to appear stupid in front of the doctor. You said endo and number 14 followed by a PGC, they're going to go, uh-huh. Because when the doctor's talking, the doctor sounds like God, and you don't want to look stupid. Doctor walks out of the room, what did he say? What did she say? What does that mean? Doctors, if you're not comfortable talking to patients, role play this with your staff. So, speaking of role playing, what do your patients ask you? And by the way, your clock is ticking. It's five minutes to lunch. Let me just, where's my big key? All right, I like games, I like role playing. Somebody catch. <laughs> I'm not bad. Somebody catch, and somebody catch. Okay, who has the orange one? Stand up. Thank you, your name? My name's Kelly. Kelly, where are you from? Sebastopol, California. Oh, she's from a nice, warm, and sunny place. All right, Kelly, I am your patient. Okay, uh, so I heard that if you take out the mercury from my fillings, that I'm going to be healthier. We're not going to make you healthier by removing the amalgam, but we will reduce the total burden on your body from carrying that with you. Okay, but, but can you just take out the mercury from the fillings? We have to remove the entire filling so that we can replace it with a composite material. Okay, good for Kelly. <laughs> okay, it's got purple. All right. Um, I was reading, I was looking some stuff up on the internet before I came here, and I want to get that mercury out of my fillings. But I read about the plastic materials, and don't they have harmful stuff in them too? Great. In case you didn't hear, what is your name? Uh, Dr. Alt. Dr. Alt, and where are you from? Here. Nice, convenient in your neighborhood. Dr. Alt gave one of the perfect answers. If someone is concerned and they've got a wealth of questions and they may be medically compromised for a number of ways, give them that alternative. There are materials that are or substances that are in some restor restorative materials that are not in others. There is sophisticated blood testing available so we can know exactly which ones you can't tolerate. All right, who has purple or green? There we go, green. Your question. Oh, well, not bad. <laughs> Just like your answer is better than your throat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I know the doctor switched, and I've been coming here for 10 years now, and I love your practice, and, and I read that whole thing in the newsletter that you're not doing the mercury fillings anymore. But I only want what my insurance is going to pay for. And your name? Tammy. Tammy, where are you from? Huntley. Oh, right in the, right in the neighborhood as well. Okay, so Tammy, you've, are you business staff or assistant? Front office. Front office. So Tammy, you know I've been coming here forever. And, and you know I've got Delta Dental. So <laughs> I got good insurance. I only want my insurance going to pay for Tammy. Yay, Tammy! All right. Um, <laughs> Tammy's had this question before. In their office, they are not insurance dependent. Patient pays at time of service. 
patient submits form and patient gets reimbursed. Anybody insurance dependent or PPO? Not PPO. Not PPO. Okay, now what happens Okay, but, okay, first, the comment was patient is okay, sends in the claim form, gets reimbursed to a lesser degree, and now is upset with Tammy. Your insurance has a policy where they downcode the uh, to a number, and how your policy would Okay. Yeah, as I was going to say, an 80% complete answer. The insurance has downcoded to the benefit of an amalgam. You can call your insurance company. I would end that with saying call your HR department. They bought the policy. They can explain what they bought. And in essence, they've just cut your benefits. So it's kind of like taking a pay cut. We, know, we normally always tell the patient that they are the one that are contracted by their insurance company, that it's their responsibility to make sure that they know exactly what their insurance is looking So you never get into it with them like, well, this is a Okay, but you're leading to my next step here. Once you become a mercury-free practice, the nomenclature changes and the behavior of the staff has to reflect that. What the staff says has to reflect that. First, we don't do that anymore. We have learned, science has advanced, just like mammography is now thermography is the top of the line, we have also advanced. Doctor has taken some classes, learned a wealth of information about the science, and what we thought was that this mercury was locked into your filling, it wasn't a problem, we've now learned is a potential problem. It leaks, it leaks all the time. You eat, you chew, anything warm, it's going to leak and it's a body burden. Dr. Smith is doing a health service here and it hurts him, if you're talking to a woman especially, it hurts him to his core that this is what he was taught in school by, by educators that he really trusted based on the knowledge that they had back then. But we know differently now. We're not going to do that. And it's going to cost you 10 bucks more filling. But we're not going to put something harmful into you. You've heard the stories about eating tuna fish more than twice a week. Well, there's a whole heck of a lot more mercury in your body from tuna fish, and it's not just you. It's all of our staff that we're worried about because we're breathing that stuff, and the doctor's breathing that stuff, and that's why we're wearing masks. When you explain it in a way that people can understand it, they're going to buy into it, 10 or $20 more. If you lose a few patients, if I'm really insurance dependent, I've been coming to you for 10 years, and you tell me it's going to cost 10 or 20 bucks more for a filling, I'm going to stay there. I like your practice. It's not that much more. Gasoline's gone up. Groceries have gone up. Milk's gone up. Fillings have gone up. But explain it to them in a way that they understand. Science has advanced filling materials, just like it's advanced everything else. Besides the fact, you know what, by the time we're done, that tooth is going to look so good, it's going to look like it never had a cavity before. Everybody likes that. Okay. So, the predictive dialogue. You have this in your handout, so I'm not going to go through it. But you're going to script out what you want to say. Whenever possible, provide a, re a written treatment estimate showing both cost and time. It's going to take about six visits to get all this cleaned up, and it's going to cost about $4,000. This is how we break it down. And, very importantly, is there anything in your schedule I should know before we set your appointment? Doctor could be all set to work on Mrs. Smith. She's got some period disease. She's got um, oh, some restorations to be changed. And he's thinking, I know there's a hole next week. We can put her in. We can get her in Monday morning. But when Mrs. Smith gets up to the business desk, is there anything I should know before we schedule your appointments? I'm going to a wedding next week, and I'm going to be in Memphis, Tennessee. We are. We're going to a wedding. Well, you don't want to offer that appointment on Monday because then she's going, oh, whoa, okay, no, I can't do that, I can't do that, I'm out of town. But if she says, I've got a wedding coming up, and you notice in her treatment plan, one of the things she wanted to do was bleaching. So, well, you know, let me talk with doctor right now. We might be able to make some bleaching trays for you before you leave. And then we'll start working on that infection right after you get back. 
or let's get you something that's a little more extensive. Let's get you started so that you won't have any problems before you leave town for that wedding. And then we can take care of the rest of your work after you get back. Dealing with coworkers, this ever happened in your office? As much as we want to watch what we say with our patients, we're no different. Set conversational boundaries. I hate calling ABC Lab. Why is it always my job to call ABC Lab when they don't get that case back on time? I can't stand that ABC Lab. If you've got someone negative in your office, just go, yeah, they're paying the next. Sorry, short straw, you make the call and get out of there. Agree that there are subjects you won't discuss at work. We are all human beings. If you've ever had somebody going through a divorce in your office, you don't want the details. Or you have a 20-something who is dating a lot. You don't need the details. Just tell them, you know what? I, I just keep personal life out of the office. I like the details. You like <laughs> Maybe lunchtime details. <laughs> and you can turn complaint sessions into strategy sessions. You don't like ABC Lab? Okay, let's bring up this next staff meeting. Put it up at the agenda. ABC Lab. Ways we could make this work and reason why. Whoops, wait a minute, And reasons why it won't. And then let everybody add their comments. Bring it up at the staff meeting. Maybe we need a different lab. Maybe there's a reason why doctor needs ABC Lab. Find out. Figure out what you can do about it. And when all else fails, use laughter and humor. There are situations in our lives that will just grind you until you put a different mental picture there. There are some patients who will drive you nuts until you give yourself permission to have a different mental picture of that. And we all have those patients. And of course, I'm unique, you're unique. And if you're of a certain age, yeah, you're just... <laughs> All right, dealing with insurance companies. Let's go through this part a little quicker. Mercury-free dentistry is no different than any other. File it, don't pile it. If you're a PPO office, whatever, you file it. If you're not insurance dependent at all, make sure you give the paperwork to your patients to submit. Benefits may be reduced. In most cases, they are going to be reduced. But insurance companies are responsible to their shareholders, never to their patients. Aetna is never going to call your patients and say, you know, if you let that benefit lapse, I get to keep your money. And predetermination is not the same as preauthorization or eligibility. Anybody here have Delta? Delta of Michigan, Delta of Ohio, Delta of California. Delta has just done an interesting thing. They now think that bite wings are a covered benefit every 24 months. Now, if you have any patients in your practice between the ages of, say, high school and early 30s, they're probably pop drinkers. They're probably on the fast track. You let a little teeny DO on 29 go because you didn't take bite wings. What's going to be there in two years? Endo, crown. If you have to, I think the best way to explain, well, you're going to have to. The best way to explain it to your patients is <clears throat> your employer just gave you a reduction in salary. You no longer have this as a benefit. But I strongly suggest we're going to take the bite wings today. You're going to pay X amount of money for it. But here's the thing. If I find little cavities, I can take care of them while they're little cavities. Piece of cake, in and out, cost you a little bit in time, a little bit in copay. At your age, we let this go. Or at your level of stress, or at your history, your dental history. We let this go. Next time we're eligible for x-rays, you're going to have something massive on your hands. Chances are you're going to be calling me some weekend night because you're in pain. Chances are it's going to take three to four visits to take care of it. Chances are your copay is going to be so much more costly and you're going to lose a lot of time off of work. It makes sense to take the x-rays now and just pay the difference out of pocket. If you have a diagonal debt, use that every other visit as well. Oh, by the way, this is also a stall tactic, and it's only useful to use the maximum the insurance carrier will pay, and that's only if you don't have internet or fax capability. Every insurance company now, except for maybe some of the very small unions, have websites. You can get the benefits right then and there. In many cases, you get real-time dollar values left for that year. Sending out a predetermination is something that patients have ingrained in their mind because they come from medical 
thought process that says, I need to know, and this is the way it's done. We have to re-educate them. That's not the same in the dental world. What patients really want, the beautiful, healthy smile, I used to say it's never, but I found out rarely, dependent on dental insurance. Ah, there we go. Americans want something everybody else has. If you're a man, I bet you want that 60-inch plasma TV. If you're a woman, it could be something much smaller, a little trinket. The drive, even with the economy, is to consume more and better and to continually raise our level of comfort. Neat, neat story, neat book, Green with Envy, Sure Boss, if you haven't read it, just came out last year. Despite the economy, and despite anything that you're going to hear on TV, read in the news, try and buy an airline ticket. Seats are gone, people are traveling. Look at the boat shows, people are buying boats. People still have disposable income. They're choosing where to spend their dollars. They can choose your quality care, so don't compromise. Overall, they set their goals on what others are doing. That's the smile they want. You cannot look in the mirror with messed up teeth and feel good about yourself. If you're doing cosmetic dentistry, and let's face it, once you've made the change from amalgam to mercury-free practice, you're in the realm of cosmetics. And you learn about the different materials. You start doing lumineers or veneers. The more and more that you do, the better your patients feel. Everyone wants this smile, men as well as women. So see the roses, not the thorns. If you're insurance dependent, you're always going to feel that conflict. If you're a doctor who's insurance dependent and says, I just don't know, guess what? There are a couple other little things that you can do. You can give away a free service. If you're doing eight units of dentistry on someone and you know that they can't afford it, you go, you know what, Mrs. Smith, you've been coming here a long time. Um, today's your lucky day. I'm giving you two of those for free. Don't charge it to the insurance. Or if you know that they don't, their insurance is going to cover it, throw in a couple. You feel good, they feel good. You can't buy that kind of advertisement because when Mrs. Smith leaves your office, guess who she's telling? Everybody down the street? Everybody she knows? Look at this. See? She'll cut that down. I look, huh? there, there's nothing silver in my teeth. It's your option to choose the type of practice that you want based on your own values. And staff, if your doctor is not taking care of your teeth, sit down with them Monday morning, him or her, and say, I'm your ambassador. I need this done. Schedule it in. Many times in our practice, we, we don't usually work on Fridays, but we'll do a staff day on Friday. Nobody's getting paid, one assists for the other, and they all take care of their needs. And nobody's asked, so I'll answer it. Do we charge? No. Lab bills only. Every office has their own way of doing it, but that seems to be the fairest way. Oh, that you can't read. It says everything you can imagine is real. There are not seven sons in that picture. We know it's time-lapse photography. We know that the majority of people that have bright, bright, beautiful white teeth are probably wearing lumineers. Does anybody care? No, because they've got the bright white smile. Lumineers, veneers, whatever. Do the right thing. Take care of your patients. They pay your salary. We have a patient in our office, Joe. When Joe's name comes up on caller ID, we kind of backpedal. He talks a long time. He sends us very long, lengthy faxes. Now he has our email. Yeah. But you know what? We put on our big girl clothes and we answer the phone and we take care of him. He still deserves the same amount of care. And he makes everybody else look good. So think of that when you're not, when there's somebody, you go, yep, the rest of our people look good. Talk to your patients as if they were your relative. Don't use words that you couldn't use at the Thanksgiving table. And never, never use like as a repetitive word or hun. Like is my <coughs> little thorn. It's like, 
Well, see, it's and, and then it's like, oh, but but like if we did the the, the like the, the little sucky thing that takes out like your spit, like, okay, you're professionals. Do not talk like a 16 year old, and please don't use hun. My name isn't hun. If you're taking care of me at a restaurant, you call me hun on the second time, I will dress you down. I have a name. Please, it's you can say ma'am, you can say miss, but don't use hun. For starters, if you're using that word, it's a sign of disrespect to whoever you're talking to, and that's not what you intended at all. And second, it's a sign that you are not well educated. Do you know how many words are in the human? Or, sorry, in the um, English language. Throw out a number. Oh, not even close. Bigger number. Million. Not that many. Half a billion. Five hundred thousand words in the English language. Venture guess how many the average person uses? You're close. Three hundred words. Out of half a million, we use three hundred words. Take Han out of your vocabulary. Choose a new word. <laughs> no matter who you are in the office, always act professional. Dress like a professional. Limit your jewelry. If your business staff or you're an assistant, big dangly weekend earrings have no place in your office. And natural looking fingernails or a very nice light color fingernails, green fingernail polish, okay, great on weekends, not in the office. Speak well. If you haven't read a good book lately, get books on tape. A lot of libraries have them, books on CDs. You stick them in, or you can even put them on your MP3 players. Stick them in your car on your way to work. Learn a lot about the world, increases your vocabulary, and it's painless. Listen carefully. There's more that happens in the silence than in all the words you can use. When you're talking to your patient and you're presenting a treatment and you're close to your patient, pause three, four seconds. It doesn't sound like a long period of time, but stop. That was four seconds. In that time, they're digesting what you said, and then they can look up again. If you've got a complicated treatment plan, and you're trying to make them understand, they're going to go through six months of services, they're going to go through thousands of dollars worth of services, give them those few seconds of pause for this to sink in. They'll think of something else to ask you, and when they're finished, they're going to feel like they had your attention. They're going to know they had your attention. They're going to know that you felt like you could take care of them. And you're going to know that this is a patient for life. And when they get home, when they go back to work, where were you today? I was at the dentist. Oh, you were at the dentist. No, no. I like my dentist. You know, I, I got a bunch of stuff to do, but I got a feeling it's going to be okay. When you lose track of what you're saying to them and you can't find a way to relate, always bring it back to a car. The majority of your clientele is going to be middle-aged, baby boomers, because we're the ones now with the disposable income, got to get it done, want to look good. Bring it back to a car. Okay, you know, it's kind of like that car that you really like. It's getting a little old, got a few miles on it. You've been ignoring a few things and now some of the little idiot lights are coming on. You gotta take it in, get it checked out. Well, your teeth are kind of like that. You know, you ignore them for a little while. Yeah, those big old metal fillings, hot and cold, spans, tracks, they break. Break the tooth underneath it too. Um, you know, it takes a little time and money to get your car running again, but you don't chuck the car. It's still a good car. Well, we're not gonna just remove all your teeth like they did in the 1950s. It's gonna take a little time, a little money but we're gonna get you taken care of and we can do it comfortably too. That's what they wanna hear. Saying thank you is a lost art. When's the last time you got something handwritten in the mail? Think back, have you gotten anything since the first of the year handwritten in the mail? You read those first. 
send a real handwritten letter, just a little note card. Somebody who's had something difficult. The little lady who comes in and you know she got all dressed up just to see you today. They work better when they're sent home. There was a time we used to send things to business. But you know what? There's too much stuff on everybody's desk. Don't send it to their business. They'll read it. They'll toss it. If you send them, oh, sorry, this was taken from a business meeting, an employee, but a patient, a thank you note at work, it ends up in the garbage. If you send it to the person at home, it's on the refrigerator for a year. Mention their family, stays posted for two years. Now, little Jimmy comes in, and you know he's a little snotty kid. But today, he was pretty good. Draw a little note to Jimmy. You know, hey, you did great. Nice to see you today. Stick it off in the mail. Draw another quick note to Mrs. Smith. Hey, you know what? Just want to tell you, Jimmy's turned out to be a fine young man. You know, he asked some good questions and he really helped out today. Just want to let you know. Now, what happens? Mrs. Smith gets the note. <laughs> hey, he's not such a little snotty kid when he gets out in public after all. She starts acting a little nicer to her son. You know what? His self-esteem goes up pretty well. Guess what? Next time that postcard comes in for a six-month checkup. Hey, I like it at that office. And you get the type of patience you deserve. Little Jimmy turns out to be a pretty good little kid after all. Finally, the law of economics. <laughs> because as altruistic as you want to be, if you're not capitalistic and you're not turning a profit, you won't be in business tomorrow. You cannot advance economically without a positive cash flow. Not going to happen. And every person in the office is an ambassador. Doctors, if you do not share your goals with your staff, they will not know when they reach them. Staff, you keep that information confidential. Doctor, you need to say, in our practice, next year, I need to make a million too. We've been making a million one. We have X amount of staff and you all like to be paid well. We have business overhead, rent, utility bills that eat up 50% of our um, production. Now, if we just collected another 1% of our revenue, look what we would have. I want to give everybody a raise this year, but I can't afford to do so. But if we collect 3%, right now we're collecting, let's just throw out a number, 93%. If I can collect 96%, I can give you all a raise. Suddenly, to you, that makes sense. It's not, the gosh darn guy wants to buy a new boat. Will the doctor make more money? Of course. Guess what? He went to school. He's got the, he or she has the equipment loan, has to pay the utilities, has to pay the mortgage has to buy new equipment, but you have a life too. And if you want to be successful, you make sure your doctor is successful. If you want to grow financially, you make sure the office is financially viable. And it doesn't matter, um, use Martin Luther King, if you sweep the floor, sweep it like Leonardo da Vinci painted. Everything you do is an ambassador for your office. If you don't get your teeth cleaned every six months, you can't with any conviction tell a patient that they need to come in. If you have periodontal disease and you're ignoring it, you can't with conviction tell a patient, you got an infection in your mouth. If you don't take care of it, this is getting into your bloodstream because guess what? You swallow every so many seconds. Once you know, tell your patients. You know about the dangers of mercury. You know about the hazards of fluoride. Once you know, share the knowledge. It's actually the ADA code, code of Ethics. A couple little closing tidbits. This is true. I love this fact. Who reaches for coffee every morning? A lot of people. Grab an apple instead. It actually gives you more energy. Remember earlier I said you have to put a different mental picture in your mind? Every now and then there's a situation you cannot stand. The sand in my shoe was always watching people chew gum. They look like cows. My kids do it. My kids still do it. They're in their 20s. They're all in their 20s. But it drives me crazy. So I need a new mental picture. Whatever it takes to give you that new mental picture. <laughs> Guess what you're going to think of next time you see somebody chewing gum. And my husband didn't think I was going to use that slide. 
<laughs> I have some resources in the back of your book, or the back of your packet. These are some of the best resources, no matter who you are in the dental office. If you don't know who Angie Skinner and Penny Reed are, they have a great little website called Dental Genius. It's free. You're going to get free teleforms. They're going to give you lots of practice management tips. They're dental gurus. American Association of Dental Office Managers. There's never been an organization just for us before. You'll get a wealth of information and there are sounding boards there and you can ask information of other office managers, insurance, restorative, uh, staff management, doctor and spouse working in the office together, all kinds of questions. Danby, doctors, if you are working with assistants who are not certified, for one, at least in the state of Michigan, if you're not x-ray certified, you're taking x-rays, that's not legal. Make sure they're x-ray certified. Danby is the agency that does certifying for dental assistants. They can get their CDA. They can learn how online. There are sites all over the United States where the boards are given. Very important. The last one, uh, Michelangelo Caruso, he is a business consultant, but you're going to get lots of little cool tidbits. He has five cool ideas and I think it's every two weeks you come up with just five little snippets of things. That's where I learned there are 500,000 words in the English language. And you never know when that's going to be important. Thank you for your time and attention. Again, I'm Sherry Reggiani and this is our code for today.